Hello and welcome to the Berean Voice. I'm Randy Seaver. We're continuing our study in Paul's epistle to the Romans and chapter 9. I'd like to begin again with verse 19 today. Keep in mind that what Paul has done uh, after having stated the pattern that God has established in terms of how he chooses to dispense his favors and his mercy, uh, he has shown that uh, God chose to bless Jacob and his offspring, and he chose not to bless Esau, even though these two young men were not yet born and had not done any good or evil in order that the purpose of God might stand, or concerning election might stand, that is, in order that he might establish the pattern according to which God has chosen the one and passed over the other. And so that prompted the objection, what shall we say then? Uh, is there unrighteousness with God? If, if what God does does not depend on our decision, but rather on his decision, then is God not being fair uh, in choosing one and passing over the other? And Paul, as we have seen, has uh, answered that in two ways. First of all, he tells us what God has said about himself. I will mercy whom I will mercy, I will compassion whom I will compassion. So then, it is not of him who wills or of him who runs. It is of God, and, and the question is, what is of God? And the answer is, the, the dispensing of his favors, of his mercy, of his blessing, is not of the sinner, but is of God. That is, we do not determine who receives the blessing of God. God himself determines that. And so the first thing that he has shown us is that God is the one who has determined who will receive the favor, and this is what God says about himself. And then Paul illustrates this from the life of Moses and from the life of Pharaoh. To the one he shows mercy and does so undeservedly, and to the other, he um, shows his power and makes his name great by judging uh, and judicially hardening Pharaoh. And so he's, he's illustrating the whole point that God has the sovereign right to do both of these things. And then he concludes, and in, in, let's just read the verse. In, in verse 18, he says, Therefore, he's, he's drawing a conclusion, Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. God mercies whom he wills, he hardens whom he wills. And that, of course, brings up the, the second objection. And that second objection found in verse 19 is this. Paul says, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? If God has a sovereign decree and that sovereign decree is always fulfilled, then how can God hold us accountable if we uh, simply fulfill his will in doing whatever we please? That seems to be the concept that is being set forth here. Now, as we've seen, Paul could have answered that question very simply by saying, you've misunderstood my point. I'm not saying that God has a decreed will. What I'm saying is that God has a, a, a desire for us. He has wishes for us. Uh, he has the very best of intentions for us. But, but how it turns out really depends not on God, but how it turns out really depends on us and on our decision. After all, everything is really controlled by libertarian free will. And Paul could, as we have seen, could very easily have written those words had he believed that. But that's not how Paul answers the objection. And I think it's important for us to see how Paul answers this objection. First of all, he doesn't say God does not have a decreed will. He doesn't say that we always fulfill what God has determined we are going to do. He doesn't say that at all. What he says very clearly is, who are you, O man? And as we've seen, he puts O man in the emphatic position here, and he's drawing a sharp contrast between the creature and the creator. O man, who are you to reply against God? Shall the thing formed say to him who formed it, Why have you made me this way? 
In other words, you have no right as a mere creature and a fallen creature at that to call into question God's divine intentions. That's the first thing that we see here. And uh, that would answer the question um, fully enough that should satisfy anyone. We have no right as God's creatures and much less right as his fallen and rebellious creatures to call God into the judgment bar and, and question his purposes. That's the first argument. As we're going to see, the second argument is that uh, what God has actually done in exercising his sovereign right, his sovereign freedom, does no uh, disservice or injustice to the sinner who does not receive his mercy. And we're going to look at that a little bit later. First of all, I'd like to just talk to you about uh, what we mean when we talk about the sovereignty of God. There are some on the internet who will tell you that what we mean when we talk about the sovereignty of God is that God is meticulously, deterministically uh, controlling every single aspect of our lives so that just as a, a puppeteer would control a puppet, so God controls our lives and we really have no decision, we have no will, uh, we simply move because God is pulling the strings. Now, if that were the case, we'd have a huge problem with what the, what the scriptures reveal to us about the nature and character of God. Because if that were the case, then we, as his creatures, would never, ever be disobedient. We would never, ever uh, sin and, or act contrary to his revealed will. We, that, why is that so? Well, because God is holy, and a God who is holy is not going to control his creatures and cause us to do those things that are contrary to his holy character. And so that would be a great, great problem. Uh, but obviously that is not what we mean when we talk about the sovereignty of God. What we mean when we talk about the sovereignty of God is simply that God is the Most High who reigns in the kingdom of men and does whatever he pleases, and, and no one in, in his creation has the right to call him into question for anything he has done or anything he has decided. Go back with me to a passage in the First Chronicles uh, chapter 29. Uh, David has been uh, raising an offering for the building of the temple. He says, you know, my son Solomon is still young and immature, and, and I'm here to... Uh, raise funds for the building of this temple. And I'm going to give over and above uh, what uh, I had intended to give. I'm, I've brought all of this stuff to give. And then as, as David begins to talk about what he's giving, uh, the people begin to ante up and they, they're, uh, they're giving and they're doing so liberally. And uh, David is just uh, overwhelmed with the work that God is doing in them to cause them to give so willingly. And this is what the text says in, um, in First, Chron First Chronicles 29. In, um, in verse 10 of this, that passage, we read, David, Therefore David blessed Yahweh before the assembly, and David said, listen to it, Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. And you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you. And you reign over all. That's what we mean by the sovereignty of God. You reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand is to make great and to give strength to all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer to you so willingly as this? Listen to it. For all things come from you. And of your own, we have given you, keep this in mind, you will never give anything to God that God has not first 
given to you. You do not take the initiative in honoring and worshiping and glorifying God. If you are reflecting back to God what God has revealed to you, then he has first given to you, uh, and therefore he owes you nothing. For all things come from you, and of your own we have given you. You see, that's what we mean when we talk about the sovereignty of God. We mean that God has the sovereign right. He reigns. He is the one uh, who gives us the ability to do everything that we do. He is the one who rules over all. He is the sovereign. He is the king. Now, do we believe that God is ordering all things according to the counsel of his will? And the answer is yes, that is exactly the way Paul describes him in, in Ephesians 1 and verse 11. He is the God who is, and, and the word that he uses for working is an interesting word, it means to energetically and effectively accomplish something. In other words, God is, according to his decree, that is, what he has decided is going to occur in his universe, God is effectively and energetically accomplishing all of that, and he's doing so meticulously. That is, there is nothing that is outside of God's control. Uh, God never says, whoops, I didn't intend that. Uh, that that's never going to happen. Okay, He is effectively and energetically accomplishing everything according to the counsel of his will. Now, if he's accomplishing it according to the counsel of his will, then the counsel of his will must have occurred, his purpose must have occurred prior to the accomplishment, accomplishment of those things that he has determined will happen. So everything that occurs happens in accordance with the plan that God has set. Now, does that mean that God is the one who is causing everything that occurs in his universe to cause. He is the proximate cause of everything, uh, so that if a person commits sin, it must have been God who put that sin in his heart and caused him to desire to do that. No, that's not what we believe. And so we do not believe that God is simply pulling the strings. What we believe is that God is the one who has the, the absolute authority to do with his creatures as he will. You remember the parable back in Matthew 20. There was a, a vineyard owner who went out into the marketplace really early in the morning, and uh, he saw some people standing there idle. They had no work, and so he said, I want to pay you a certain amount of money to come into my vineyard and work for me, and at the end of the day, I'll pay you that amount. And about three hours later, he went out and did the same thing, and then three hours later, and then finally at the 11th hour, he went out and he hired, a pe hired people, and he said to them, come work in my vineyard, and I'm going to give you what is right. At the end of the day, when it came time to pay all of these workers, the vineyard keeper gave to these last workers the same thing he had promised to give to the first workers. And they supposed that, they, that he should have given them more. And he said to them, I'm not doing you any wrong. Did I not agree with you at the beginning of the day that this is the amount that I was going to pay you? It's really none of your business if I'm going to pay these other workers equal to you, even though they've only been here a short time. Ultimately, the, the issue is the same as we find here in Romans chapter 9. The, the issue is the inclusion of the Gentiles in God's uh, pale of grace and mercy. Um, and, and the Jewish people are saying, wait a second, you, that this isn't right. You made a promise to us, and now you're going to give them the same thing you promised to us? And the vineyard owner says this. Listen to it very carefully. Do not I have the right, the authority, to do what I will with my own things? Do not I have the right, do not I have the authority to do what I will with my own things. And that's exactly what Paul is teaching here in Romans chapter 9. He is teaching us that God has the right to show mercy to people from among the Gentiles in exactly the way that he has shown mercy 
to people from among the Jewish people, the nation of Israel. And that's really what Paul's talking. He's talking here about the authority to do what God has done. And we have no right as creatures to call him into question. Both the Isaiah 29 passage and the Isaiah 45 passage, and then the Isaiah, uh, Jerem, uh, the, pardon me, the Jeremiah 18 passage, all teach us this lesson that the potter has power or authority over the clay to make one vessel unto honor, that is for noble purposes, to be used in the palaces of kings, and another vessel as chamber pots to carry out the excrement. And the potter has every right to make vessels as he wishes, and the, the clay has no input into the matter whatsoever. It is the, the divine decision, not the decision of the sinner, that determines who to whom God is going to show mercy. Listen to the, the Jeremiah passage. This is what we read in verse 4. We are told that the, the potter refashioned this vessel Listen to the words, as seemed best or as was well-pleasing to him. And then we read in verse 6, as the clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand. These are the words of Yahweh himself. As the clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand. Now, someone will say, but wait a second, in this very passage, he says to them, uh, I'm calling you to repentance, and if you repent, then I'm not going to do what I said I was going to do, uh, and if you don't repent, then I'm going to bring this judgment on you. And that's exactly what Paul is doing in the passage before us. What Paul is doing is, he's saying, look, God is sovereign in the, in the dispensation of his mercy and his grace, but you are responsible for that. If you repent then God is going to show you mercy. And you're going to learn about the decree of God after you have repented. But the decree of God was there all along. God is doing what he's, he's planned to do from the very beginning. You learn about it after the fact. We can only understand uh, life looking backward. We have to live it moving forward. But we can only understand what happens looking backward. One of the old Puritans, and I think we may have already mentioned this, Thomas Watson said, the, the sovereignty of God and the providence of God and God's decree are the Christian's diary, but must never be his Bible. We don't, we don't get up in the morning and, and say, I wonder what God has decreed for me to do today. No, we act according to his revealed will. When we witness the gospel, we don't say, I wonder if God has chosen to save these people to whom we are witnessing the gospel. No, we simply bring to them the promise of God and tell them that if they will repent and believe God's promise, God is going to save them. Uh, if God does show them mercy and grace, then we must understand that, that he is showing them mercy and grace in accordance with his sovereign plan. This is what God has intended to do. But we don't understand that before, before the fact. We can't understand or know what God has decreed before it occurs. Once something occurs, then we can say, that was determined by God. That was what God intended to happen, or it would not have happened. I hope you're understanding that distinction. If, if you need to, leave a comment below, leave a question below, and we'll try to, to, to uh, talk, speak to those. But listen, listen to what these people in Jeremiah uh, chapter 18 said in verse, uh, chapter 18 said in verse 12. We will continue with our own plans. Each of us will follow the stubbornness of of his evil heart. And so that brings us to, to Paul's second uh, answer to this objector. The first is, you have no right to question God. The second is, if God refuses to show mercy to fallen and rebellious sinners, then that is God's absolute right to do that. And he does no injustice to any sinner in passing him over. Listen, we've said this before. I want you to get it again. 
Uh, if it's worth saying once, then it's worth repeating, and I hope it was worth saying once. But listen, God does not do any injustice to any sinner in withholding from some sinners what no sinner deserves. God does not do any injustice to sinners in withholding from some sinners what no sinner deserves. And so what Paul is setting forth here is the, the, the sinfulness of this lump out of which God makes one vessel for noble purposes and another vessel for ignoble purposes. There is no injustice in that. God is not, why not? Well, because the lump out of which he is choosing them is a, or are not choosing them, passing over them, is a sinful lump. How do we know that? Well, we know that because uh, this is what Paul wrote. Listen to it. Verse 22, what if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction or fit for destruction? and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory. Notice he prepared them beforehand. This is not something that happened after they decided what they were going to do. This is something that Yahweh had decided beforehand. But here's the point. Both wrath and mercy and grace presuppose sinfulness. God doesn't have wrath against nothing. And I'm not speaking incorrect English in saying that. God does not have wrath against nothing. God has wrath against something. And what is that something? The wrath of God can be defined, and I think this is probably very close to the definition that John Murray in his commentary on Romans has given us of the wrath of God. The wrath of God is the revulsion of his entire being against that which is the contradiction of his holiness, namely our sin. It is the, it is the, the settled indignation of Jehovah against our sinfulness. So if wrath exists, then sin must exist. There can be no wrath of God where there is no sin for God to react to. But God's inevitable reaction to sin is going to be a reaction of wrath. And we, know, we are not to understand that as a flying off the handle in a fit of temper, uh, but uh, we are to understand that as a, a deep, settled indignation against sin and sinners. And so that's the first way that we know that this lump is a sinful lump because God's wrath is engaged against some of those who are part of this lump. And the second way we know that the lump is sinful is because God's mercy and, and grace is extended to those who are part of this lump, some of those who are part of this lump. How does that show, show us that the lump is sinful? Because mercy and grace presuppose sinfulness. God is not merciful apart from human sinfulness. Now, that doesn't mean that his, his attribute is not to be merciful and compassionate and loving and so forth. But, but it is to say that in, in the exhibition of his, his uh, grace and mercy, grace and mercy are always exhibited in the face of human sinfulness. And so it's very clear that the, the lump out of which these are chosen are, are a fallen lump. Now listen to what he goes on to say. Verse 22, keep in mind our presupposition. We mentioned this way earlier in our, in our exposition of Romans in, in terms of presuppositions. Our presupposition is that God's primary purpose God's primary desire, that which God desires above everything else, is the manifestation of his glory. And when we speak about the glory of God, we are simply talking about the manifestation of his glorious attributes. 
Now, what are his glorious attributes? Well, uh, the Westminster uh, Shorter Catechism asks that question. What's, what, is, what is God like? Uh, God is spirit, infinite, and eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. And so you have holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. And, and goodness can be expanded into love and mercy and long-suffering and all the rest of that. And those, those are the attributes of God. And what happens in the, in the manifestation of God's glory is that God makes known his power. God makes known his long-suffering. God makes known his mercy. God makes known his grace. But you see, if God saved everyone, there would be no manifestation of his justice and his holiness and his wrath. If God chose not to save anyone, there would be no manifestation of his love and his mercy and his grace and his long-suffering and so forth. And so the only answer that we can find in terms of how God reveals all of his glory is that God has determined that he is going to give justice to some and show mercy and grace to others. And that's what he's saying in this passage. God wants to make his wrath known and to make his power known. And so he endures with much long suffering. Notice that God does not immediately stamp out sinners in his justice, but God waits, is merciful. He gives people space to repent. This is one of the things that we, we learn in, in um, 2 Peter 3, 9, that verse that is often quoted that has nothing at all to do with the decree of God, um, and yet people want to say, see, God can't have a saving decree because God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But listen to the entire verse. Read the entire context. What is the subject that Peter is talking about? I'm not going to try to go through that verse for the sake of time, but I want you to go and look at the context. What is he saying? I don't think we need to deny that God is showing his long suffering towards sinners and giving them space to repent. What he wants from us is not to take us to heaven when we die, but what he wants from us is our repentance. And because God is holy, he cannot but desire that his creatures also be holy. But that has nothing to do with the decree of God to save some people for himself and leave others to their just destruction. And so don't quote that verse to try to prove that what Romans chapter 9 is clearly teaching can't be true. Both of these things are true. And there is no contradiction between them. God is saving whom he will. Um, God is long-suffering to sinners. And what is the ultimate end of this long-suffering? Well, Peter goes on to say, and people almost never want to quote what we find later in that very chapter. But Peter says, knowing this, that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. In other words, the reason God is being long suffering with his, his chosen people is that he's giving us space to repent and he's going to bring us ultimately to repentance. But God, you see, is, is long suffering. He's merciful. What what would God have done if, if he had acted in strict justice as soon as Adam and Eve fell into sin? And the answer is, his hammer of justice would have fallen on them immediately. They would have been killed right away. But God did not immediately execute his justice as he had every right to do. But God was long-suffering. And we see the, the long-suffering of God. Some have surmised that the reason that Methuselah lived so long is because Methuselah's name, as you know, means after he is gone, after, after he is dead, it shall come in reference to the flood. And so God was giving him many, many, many years to live before the flood came to give space to repent for those who were hearing uh, Noah's message. Uh, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but interesting speculation. Um, 
God is a patient God. God doesn't immediately stamp out sinners and judge us. He wants to show his power, if you will, his restraint in not judging us immediately. What would we do if we were in his place and we had been treated as he has been treated? And the answer is the hammer of our justice would fall right away because we don't have that kind of power, that kind of patience. But God shows his power in restraining himself and granting sinners space to repent. And then he talks about these people as vessels of wrath prepared for or fit for destruction. And then in verse 23, he says, and that he might, listen to it again, make known the riches of his glory. We find that so often in scripture. This is what God is doing. God is making his glory known. God is manifesting himself. And he could do nothing that was any Uh, more gracious and kind for his creatures than to do just that because to view him and to see him in his beauty and in his glory is the greatest blessing that we should we could ever experience and so that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy listen to it which he had prepared beforehand for glory even us whom he called. Now listen to this. When Paul uses this word called, he is not talking about a mere invitation to the Gentiles. When Paul uses this word called, he is using it in the way he has already defined it for us back in chapter 8 when he says we are the called ones according to his purpose. Notice here he says he prepared these vessels beforehand for glory. And so we are called according to that beforehand preparation. We are called according to that purpose. Even us whom he has called, not, listen to the preposition, not out of the Jews only, but also out of the Gentiles. In other words, Paul is not simply talking here about an offer of mercy, a proposition uh, offering them the possibility of receiving mercy. He's talking here about calling a people for himself effectually out of the Jewish people and out of the Gentiles. God has the right to do that. Now, we're going to quit with that for right now, but um, what he's going to do in verses 25 uh, through 28, uh, pardon me, 29, <clears throat> is that he is going to show us that what God is declaring now that he has done is what he prophesied he was going to do during in the Old Covenant Scriptures. And we're going to look at those verses perhaps somewhat briefly, and then we're going to get into the uh, next uh, answer that Paul is giving to this objection that was raised back in chapter uh, 9 and verse 6, and that is that Israel's fall is Israel's fault. Israel's fall is Israel's responsibility. Israel did not fall Through any fault of God, Israel fell because of her stubborn rebellion against Yahweh and her persistence in seeking after false gods. We're going to look at that, uh, and um, that runs all the way into and to the end of chapter 10 of Romans. Israel is responsible for her own fall. And therefore, God cannot be blamed that he is now turning from Israel and hardening Israel and turning to the Gentiles. We're going to talk about that as as we've mentioned in in our next video. But until then, may God richly bless you.